Those who are familiar with my content know that I'm a big dungeon guy. Not only did I make uh, a couple of videos on the topic, but the very first word I ever uttered on this channel was literally the word dungeons. It's by far one of my favorite elements in video games. There's something about entering a dark cave or ancient crypt not knowing what lies ahead that really gets me fired up. It calls back memories of a time when I used to go out and explore abandoned buildings with my friends. Something I don't do anymore nowadays, mostly because my wife doesn't want me to. So for me, video games are the next best thing. It shouldn't come as a surprise then that one of my favorite areas in Elden Ring are the catacombs, which are these optional mini dungeons located all over the map, mostly tucked away inside canyons or hidden along cliff sides. They are creepy, dimly lit and sometimes surprisingly complex and challenging, especially those found in the mid to late game. This kind of stuff is my jam. It doesn't matter how many games I play, I will always have a soft spot for dungeon crawling like this. So when I discovered my first catacomb and realized what it was, well, let's just say my excitement was to die for. Now initially I actually discovered the catacombs completely by accident, the result of me obsessively searching every nook and cranny on the map to find secrets and things of interest. It wasn't until about a quarter of the way into my first playthrough that I realized you can actually interact with these statues, and when you do they project a beam of light that guides you towards a nearby crypt. Some of you will think I'm an idiot for finding this out so late into the game, and I probably am, but I had successfully avoided spoilers as much as humanly possible, so I had little to no problem knowledge going in. And I'm still glad I did, because figuring out how the game works on my own was a big part of the enjoyment for me. There's probably a hint somewhere that explains the statues, maybe in one of the loading screens or the strategy guide or something, but if there is, it went right over my head. There's plenty to cover about the catacombs, and today I want to focus primarily on the level design, and how FromSoft manages to present a fun and engaging dungeon experience purely through smart enemy placement and navigational challenge. I'll even throw in some basic lore to set the mood. Do keep in mind that there will be spoilers regarding some locations and puzzle solutions. If you're still playing or planning to and want to figure it all out on your own, I advise coming back later. And to those who decide to stay, well, grab your torch or strap on your pocket lantern, or both, as we venture below ground into the crypts of the Lands Between. The story behind the catacombs is that they were built for those who earned themselves a proper death, which according to a lingering spirit inside one of the crypts means that your soul or essence is called back to the roots of the earth tree. See, death is a bit of a strange phenomena in Elden Ring. When the earth tree was still in its infancy, the current ruler of the lands between, Queen Marika, basically decided that she didn't like the concept of dying. As such, she took the rune of death from the Elden Ring and gave it to her half-brother Malekith, who would go on to bind it into his sword. This essentially removed the concept of death from the lands between, and those touched by the grace of the Earth Tree, including Marika herself and her demigod children, were able to enjoy a form of immortality. It's a bit of a complicated topic, but from what I understand you could still die in the flesh, but as long as your soul remained intact and you had grace on your side, you could simply return to the Earth Tree to be born anew. And as for Malekith, he became a sort of grim reaper, the only living being capable of dealing true death at the hands of his black blade and thus he was feared by everyone, including the demigods. This is why all catacombs feature tree roots snaking along its walls and ceilings, most notably inside the boss chamber. These roots are directly connected to the earth tree itself, and the catacombs were purposely built close to them to ease the transition into the next life for those laid to rest here, also known as an earth tree burial, which was seen as a great honor and privilege. The many traps and certain enemies like the imps and the earth tree burial watchdogs were put in place to ward off grave robbers and prevent the destruction disturbance of these sacred sites. Still, some managed to circumvent these security measures in the past. The Watchdog's Greatsword, for example, states that the eye engraving is missing its gem due to grave robbery. We also find a ghost in front of one of the catacombs who complains that their resting place has been violated. Clearly, not everyone respected the integrity of these sacred burial sites. Things really went south when a group of assassins stole a fragment of the Rune of Death from Malekith and used it to kill one of Marika's demigod children. 
Godwin the Golden, the first demigod to truly die since the establishment of America's reign, an event which became known as the Night of the Black Knives. However, for reasons that are currently not entirely clear, Godwin perished only in soul, yet his body remained alive somehow, transforming him into the very first undead, or those who live in death as they are commonly referred to. Basically a being who lives on without a soul. His body was laid to rest at the central roots of the earth tree right below the capital, perhaps with the faint hope that he would still find his way back to the earth tree somehow or that he would still find some sense of peace in the afterlife. This action, although probably well intended, inadvertently caused an infection to spread across the entire root system and soon after more undead started rising from the grave across the lands between, including inside the catacombs. Spooky. So yeah, that's the basic story behind the catacombs and why they became infested. Of course, it also serves as an excuse to have creepy enemies present in the first place. After all, you can't have a classic dungeon like this without at least having some zombies and skeletons in there somewhere. So let's switch gears and leave the lore behind and instead talk about dungeon design and what makes them so effective. What I love most about the catacombs, well, aside from the haunting music and creepy atmosphere, is its sheer simplicity. It's impressive how FromSoft manages to do a lot with so very little. The process inside the catacombs is essentially always the same. There's a big door leading to the boss, which, upon entering, is closed and can only be unlocked by activating a switch. You navigate a maze full of enemies and traps, find the lever to open said door, after which you make your way to the boss and defeat it. Or, you know, not. It's a very basic setup and it may sound repetitive if you've never played Elden Ring yourself, but you'd be surprised how much of a difference little changes and some clever tricks can make to the experience. In many ways, they remind me a lot of the classic labyrinths found in the original Zelda on the NES. In fact, I can imagine that for a lot of kids back in the day, this is what the underground labyrinths probably looked like in their imagination. I mean, with graphics like these, you kinda had to fill in the blanks. Of course, there had to be a Zelda comparison in here somewhere. I mean, it is the focal point of my channel after all, and sometimes when doing an analysis it helps to stick to familiar territory. But there's a good reason why I'm comparing the catacombs to the very first Zelda in particular, and not to any of the other installments in the Zelda series. There's fundamental differences between the more modern day Zelda games, especially the 3D ones and the NES original. Most notably for this analysis, the amount of interactivity with the environment and movement options. With every new installment the series slowly expanded these aspects, and its dungeon design reflects that change. More interactivity and mobility means you can also incorporate more complicated puzzle mechanics and means of traversal into the level design itself. There's a lot of complicated stuff going on here. Lots of creative item utilization, twisting corridors, walking on walls and ceilings, underwater mechanics, physics puzzles, anything you can think of, Zelda has probably tried it at some point. But back in the old days, the technology that allows for this kind of stuff obviously didn't exist yet. Link's movement was very basic to say the least, and the amount of interactivity was minimal. So as a dungeon designer, what do you do in a situation like this? Well, you build a maze, of course. Instead of all the fancy stuff seen in later titles, Nintendo had to rely mostly on clever enemy placement and wayfinding to create challenging dungeon environments. Essentially, the labyrinth as a whole is the puzzle. And this is where the similarities between the original Zelda and Elden Ring lie in terms of dungeon design. Outside of combat, the character doesn't really have all that many options at their disposal. You can't climb up ledges, can't pick things up like pots, for example. There's no physics puzzles or items that completely change your mobility, and because the game is built around character customization and different builds, it cannot even take into account whether or not the player is in possession of, say, a ranged weapon like a bow. So shooting a switch at long range or cutting a rope with an arrow to lower a drawbridge or something isn't really an option either. It's a much more grounded experience. I'm not saying Elden Ring rips off the original Zelda by any means, nor is it meant to be an insult to its gameplay. I'm just saying that Elden Ring embraces that old school approach to game and level design, a callback to a time when developers took a lot more risks especially with things like difficulty or hiding secrets so incredibly well that you can't help but ask yourself how people even manage to find them in the first place. The biggest difference is that nowadays we have the internet, whereas back in the day gamers were left to the mercy of gaming magazines and physical strategy guides. But most of all, it shows that you don't always need complicated mechanics to craft an enjoyable dungeon experience. Elden Ring sticks to what from soft games do best. It keeps the focus on its intricate battle system, expansive RPG elements, creative enemy and boss design, 
design, challenging difficulty, and the same clever world design we've come to expect from them ever since the first Dark Souls. Now before we go any further and discuss specific locations and puzzle scenarios, I have to briefly talk about the online mode. I hate to go a bit off track, but I just know that it's something people will bring up if I didn't at least mention it. This might be a cardinal sin in the eyes of veteran Souls players, but if you're really into exploration, finding secrets and figuring stuff out on your own, I really feel like Elden Ring is much more enjoyable when playing offline. At least for your first playthrough, that is. Of course, if you're into the PvP and co-op stuff, leaving messages and generally enjoy the interaction with other players, this obviously doesn't apply to you. For my first playthrough, I switched to offline mode after about 6 hours of gameplay, and I never regretted that decision, because it can have a pretty significant impact on how you experience dungeon environments in particular. The message system, as amazing and iconic as it is to the series, does tend to take away some of the challenge. It's a shame that there's no option to simply hide the messages while still playing in online mode, and instead you have to break the connection to the server altogether, which requires going back to the title screen first. Now you might say, well, just ignore the messages. You know, don't read them. And while you can do that, sometimes the mere presence of a message can already spoil too much. For example, there's a puzzle where standing on a specific floor will cause it to slowly move up into a ceiling of spikes, and you'll have just the right amount of time to make it across without getting impaled. But doing so only leads to an optional treasure and it won't actually move you forward. Instead you have to trigger the floor to move, quickly step away and pass underneath the floor to find a secret passage. Now I'll admit this isn't exactly the hardest puzzle ever conceived in a video game, but I generally got stuck here for quite a while, mainly because I wasn't able to see anything below the moving floor. This may vary depending on your brightness settings, but all I saw was a faint shimmer of water. However, past experiences had taught me that water usually kills you. So as you can imagine, jumping into the void below and potentially losing all my runes wasn't exactly my first thought. It also happened to be my first encounter where the game expects you to take a leap of faith like this. So I didn't know what the rules were at this stage. When I talked to my cousin about this part of the game, he revealed that he knew to jump down because he saw the glowing messages other players had left at the bottom. And there's quite a few instances in later parts of the game where you're supposed to drop down to a lower level or onto an obscure ledge, things like that. So had I been playing in online mode, there's a very good chance that the solution would have been given away prematurely. This is clearly a personal preference, maybe you didn't care about it the way I did. I just want to make sure that when I'm talking about a puzzle that I thought was smart or difficult, you at least keep in mind that I wasn't seeing the messages. Anyway, back to the catacombs. Out of all dungeon types in the game of which the- do you hear my chickens? My chickens are making a noise. Do you hear that? <sighs> Hold on. Alrighty then. Out of all dungeon types in the game, of which there's quite a few like caves, castles and mansions, only 17 are classified as catacombs. Additionally, there's also 5 hero graves, which are pretty similar and even have the same music track, but are also different enough that I would count them as separate. Generally speaking, the catacombs are more claustrophobic and labyrinthian, whereas the hero graves are more akin to an obstacle course, a race to the finish, and most of them don't even require you to flip a switch to open up the boss door. There are some exceptions and overlapping themes and mechanics but for this video I will stick to the regular catacombs. Despite repeating that same process of finding the lever to open up the door to the boss, there's just enough variation to keep them from feeling repetitive. Sometimes the door is found close to the entrance and the switch is somewhere deep inside the maze, other times it's the other way around and the switch is right at the beginning. They can be in plain sight or they can be very well hidden. Some are straightforward while others are confusing and frequently branch off into multiple directions, or have a lot of optional rooms or trap rooms you never actually have to visit. A few even straight up mess with you in a clever way. This isn't to say that every catacomb is something to write home about. Some definitely stick out more than others, which is why I'm not going to go over every single one of them individually. The Murkwater catacombs, for example, are painfully short and easy. It's one room, then a corridor leading to two more rooms, one with the switch and the other the door to the boss. That's it. There's only one enemy type, no secret passages, no traps of any kind, nothing. But it is found in the early game, so I can forgive it for that. What's cool 
cool is that the game never actually explains or hints at a solution or possibility. There's not a single instance where, say, a cutscene plays to highlight something, or some sort of sign that gives you the solution. Instead, it lets you figure it out for yourself by means of experimentation and exhausting options, or if you do play online, by players sharing information with each other. As you progress through the game and tackle more and more catacombs and other dungeon types, you'll slowly build up knowledge on the various types of tricks the developers can use to throw you off. And since they can be done out of order, you'll keep stumbling into new situations you haven't encountered before. At some point you'll discover that hitting one of these fire-breathing statues will deactivate them and make them sink into the floor. Then in order to progress in a later dungeon, you'll have to deactivate one, jump on top of it and then reactivate it to reach a floor above you. Many locations feature one or more rooms with guillotines, which obviously have to be avoided, only to have one catacomb mix it up and you'll have to ride one of the blades up to reach a new hallway. There's several instances where the way forward is hidden underneath an elevator, and similar to the spike floor I mentioned before, you'll have to trigger the elevator to move up and then step away from it so you can go underneath. None of these puzzles are particularly groundbreaking on their own, but the way the game progressively introduces new mix-ups ensures that the solution isn't always obvious. It all depends on past experience. It's not until after you've found the solution for the first time that you'll know to always check every elevator in the future, or to look for fake walls when the room seemingly doesn't lead anywhere. It's exactly because many of these dungeons can be done out of order and are completely optional that players will have vastly different experiences depending on which kind of situations they've encountered up to that point. For instance, I got stuck for way longer than I care to admit inside the Kalid catacombs, which, mind you, is very, very small. It doesn't even branch off, it's a straight shot to the boss door. However, the switch to open the door is hidden inside a central pillar of the room right before it, and up to this point in my playthrough, I hadn't come across a single illusory wall yet. So yeah, suffice it to say, I was thrown off for a good couple of minutes. Of course, once I knew this was going to be a thing inside the catacombs, finding fake walls became more intuitive. There's even one instance in the Black Knife catacombs where there's a secondary boss fight hidden behind one of these walls. Pretty sneaky. And there's much more where that came from, where one specific catacomb does something none of the others do. A couple that stand out are the Ariza side tomb, which is the only crypt that features these transporter chests that warp you all over the place, the War Dead catacombs where there's a literal ghost war going on, a battle between long dead heroes who continue to duke it out in the afterlife, and you stuck in between trying to survive this madness and find your way across. And my personal favorite, the giant mountaintop catacombs found in the late game, which to me is the perfect example of smart level design without the use of complex gameplay mechanics. As you progress through this place, you'll eventually reach a point where you feel like you're going in circles, and well, technically you are. You'll seemingly cross the same rooms and hallways over and over again, fighting the same type of enemies. And if you don't realize what's going on, you could be here for a while. Turns out that many rooms have almost identical copies with only a few differences that give them away. One enemy may be different or missing, or a statue is no longer there, hallways that used to go somewhere now lead to a dead end all of a sudden. There's basically an entire section that mirrors an earlier part of the structure. Even after you realize that this room and this one are not the same, there's still a good chance that you'll miss the way forward because it becomes uncertain what you have or haven't checked already. By the time you made it this far into the game, you'll no doubt be aware of the elevator trick by now. And before you reach the part that loops you around endlessly, you'll first come across two separate elevators. The first one actually serves as a double elevator and will take you deep down into an extensive basement level, but you'll quickly find that it doesn't lead to anything except some optional treasure. The second one has nothing underneath, just a bottomless void. From here, you'll cross the first set of duplicate rooms, but you're still on track at this point. If you were to turn back now, you would still make it back to the entrance. It's not until you drop down this hole in the wall that you'll end up in the endless loop. Once you get stuck in the loop, the game will attempt to fool you into thinking that this elevator and this one are one and the same. They look identical and each one brings you to a section that looks similar. The only difference is that one leads to a dead end and the other is where you actually came from. This presents the real possibility that you might skip on checking below this elevator because, in your mind, you've already checked it before and there was nothing there, while in reality it was a different elevator all along. It's a simple yet brilliant setup. There's another catacomb that does something similar and even goes as far as presenting you with a fake boss chamber to throw you off. There's many more examples I could list, but in terms of navigation I think you get the point. The secondary challenge to all of this is, of course, the survival aspect. 
perfect. Enemies and traps will drain your HP with every hit, and once you run out of resources, there's nothing more you can do. There's no health drops, little to no checkpoints, and death usually means going back to the grace at the entrance. Not only that, but with the exception of some mini-bosses, all enemies will respawn, so you're essentially back to square one. They also have a nasty habit of hiding enemies sneakily around the corner waiting to strike. This happens so many times, it drives me nuts. But I do realize that this was done to always keep you on your toes and discourage you from just waltzing all over the place, so I can't really complain about it. All you have to stay alive is your healing flask, and if you have a magic build, the occasional healing spell for as long as you have FP to spare. You can smash all the pots you want, but you're not going to be finding any hearts anytime soon. The only way to replenish your healing supplies is by going back to the entrance and resting at the grace. But this too will cause enemies to respawn, so it's a trade-off between dying and potentially losing all your runes, or resetting all the enemies you've worked so hard for to kill. The only form of mercy the dungeon has is that once you've unlocked the boss door, it'll stay open regardless if you die, rest at the grace, or leave the area entirely. So once you pull that lever, you can rest assured knowing that you don't have to go back and do it again, and you can just shoot straight for the boss instead. Certain traps you've deactivated, like these fire-breathing statues, will also remain as such. And finally, there are some instances where the boss is either so far away from the entrance, or the road to it is treacherous enough that the game does give you a break, by placing a checkpoint in close proximity to the boss, which is a godsend in a game where beating a boss on the first try is not a common occurrence for most people. I do have to say that in regards to combat challenge, for me personally the catacombs are more enjoyable if you're not too over leveled, maybe even slightly under leveled dare I say. It made me much more observant, patient and careful in my gameplay choices. I made much more use of stealth, trying to take as little damage as I possibly could, either avoiding enemies altogether or picking them off one by one to reduce the risk of getting swarmed by a group, which is never a good time. Luckily the catacombs do skill in difficulty depending on where you find it. Usually the more late game the area, the tougher the enemies inside. Some bosses even show up as normal enemies later on, like the watchdogs and the cemetery shade. But there were a few instances where I was definitely way too powerful, either because I went back to an early game area or I didn't find it until after I already beaten the game. And this definitely confirmed for me that being too overpowered can ruin part of the experience. I enjoyed myself a lot more when I was on edge, nervously sneaking from room to room. Once you're able to slash your way through almost anything without resistance, it does lose its charm a bit. I don't really have much to say about enemy variety. I think we can all agree that imps are the worst and they should all die in a raging barn fire, but lore-wise it does make sense for them to be present in almost every catacomb. After all, they're supposed to be guardians who protect them. The same goes for the burial watchdogs who are here for the same reason. There's definitely quite a bit of recycling here in the boss department, but let's be fair, if you're complaining about a few reused bosses in a game that has like, what, 120 of them? Of which 109 are completely unique? It's kind of hard not to sound like a snob. I'd say overall there's enough enemies of various types to keep it enjoyable. I mean, after Breath of the Wild, which had the same robots in almost every dungeon, I'm easily satisfied. And that's about all I have to say. Thank you for listening to me rambling on about dungeon crawling and level design. If you guys don't mind, I will save the shoutouts for new Patreons and channel members for an upcoming video, because I kinda ran out of time for this one. So to all the newcomers, I apologize and I hope you can wait a few more days. Oh, and in case you didn't see my latest community post, after after about two years of dodging the bullet, I have finally fallen victim to COVID. You have no idea the amount of honey-infused beverages I had to ingest just to make this voiceover possible. Anyway, starting next week I'm gonna be working on a new Zelda theory, which I'm very excited for. So I hope to see you then. This is Don, signing off, and have a good one.